Last time on Colony Confidential. The way that the pest control industry is set up in many cases that you could have somebody who sold pharmaceuticals last week and is now selling pest control this week and ends up deciding to be the lowest responsible bidder to get the account and sells the account for $5 a door. But there's 4,000 units. So he makes his month. Yay, salesperson. But the thing is, then the technician has about two and a half minutes in each unit to make his production. And then he's not going to come back for three months. So there's no assessment that's being done like IPM in agriculture at all. That nobody's looking at how many roaches are there. It's pesticide application only, not pest control. So the technician only has average 49 seconds to get in the unit, only has enough time to go in there and apply and move on to the next unit. And this has contributed to a lot of people believing I can do just as well as the pest control operator with my six cans of Raid and Hotspot. And you see this in all these apartments. What mystifies me is that the resident will have a ton of their own insecticide and there's still roaches all over the place. I'm like, don't you see? This is not working. This is what we deal with. That we're able to get rid of the cockroaches even in this situation. Yeah, a little bit in in the schooling, how we're backed up by doctors like you. And the first time, I have to tell you, you probably heard it in other podcasts. My mother was dead set against I left the bank and became an exterminator because I had hit the bottom of the barrel. So you had to hear that. My dad and my Aunt Bridie were more helpful. But when I saw Austin Frischman on Johnny Carson and he was... Oh my God. Oh yeah. And then this other guy became a good friend, Norman Cooper. So I started saying, wait a minute, there's more to this than meets the eye. And, and in New York, when I started, you went to get a 30 hour class, you passed, you went down a a 125 word street, you paid 10 bucks. You're a licensed exterminator for life. No school, no nothing. I saw these older guys, probably a lot younger than I am now. And I used to talk to them in the street. And some of them were very kind to me. I still remember them to this day. But it just has changed so much. But we need to emphasize that in these commercials and not these sugar-coated, nice places. I I agree. We should see both. Part of that NPMA advertising is to the consumer. It's also selling pest control to the residential market. Everything else, like even if you just focused on the food chain, and how influential we are in the food chain and interactions there. But because residential is such a huge piece in pest control. So I understand that commercial, but there does need to be a better educational balance to the consumer. The point is that we've often used third parties to get our point across because of the reluctance to believe us as the PMPs. Mm -hmm. So having something from MPMA like that would be also great because then you're like, here, look at the National Association. But that's the thing is I feel like our customers don't know enough about our industry because they wouldn't question anything that an electrician or a plumber said. And yet we're having to promote ourselves in a different way. And I don't understand that. We are trained professionals that are really good at what we do. We have to have education on a regular basis. And I think that needs to be promoted more often. And again, how we've managed to get this image that the human doesn't really mean much. It's all about what's in the can. We've got to change that. And especially since spray formulations just don't have the power that they used to because resistance, especially on these insects that live in homes, with people that have evolved with humans, German cockroaches and bed bugs, they've seen all the sprays we have to offer and they're like, yeah, spray me again. So we have to use a combination of sprays. I have no problem with that, but we have to find out what's working now. And right now for German cockroaches in public housing, it's baits, but we have to put a lot of bait out. And the cost of putting out two tubes of bait and the amount of time that the technician has to spend in the unit to get that done is not going to be $5 (laughs) at all. And I think that's one thing that our customers are missing as well. They don't think about technician time. For plumbers, they know that they are paying the labor cost. How much time is the plumber going to be there? 
and then that's going to be what they're paying for. Why in multi-unit housing, the amount of time that the technician is to take in each unit is completely unknown and never thought about, not considered. And working in Richmond Public Housing, one of the things that they had going on is they paid a pest control company basically $6 a door in 2010. In 2020, they were paying a pest control company $5.44 a door. Can you think of any other industry that would be less money after 10 years? And I'm like, how does this happen? But again, the managers don't know enough about what they're purchasing to even think to convert that into minutes per door. They just know it's an item checked on a budget. Yes. Pest control. Same story. My father did a hospital in, in the mid 90s and we looked at it. They were paying half of what he was charging in the mid 90s in 2019. And when we went in at three wow. times what they were currently paying, they told us we were crazy. And I said, you have roaches and mice throughout the entire facility. I'm not crazy. I wish you the best of luck. We cannot help you. You're, you're looking for elimination and the same price. That's half the price, but it's disgusting. And it's our own lack of self-worth as an industry or some of us, I should say. Again, a lot of times, one of the things that's hurting us is having sales in one end of the business and then the technicians in the other. And I think we need to be promoting to our customers how much time they get for their money. And then they can learn to associate what they're paying for with time. But if they're paying $5 a door, you're going to have a technician in there for two minutes. And then I can go and ask these apartment managers after that, does two minutes sound like long enough to you? And they're like, oh, no. And I'm like, why are you only paying for two minutes then? And they didn't realize that. They said, well, the salesman said that's how much it would be. But the result of this has been that these public housing authorities in particular, I can go in there and catch 1,300 to 1,700 cockroaches in one night in three traps. Your tax dollars are paying for that contract. And it's ridiculous. And again, it's so easy to get out of because the contractor and then the apartment manager can say, well, the resident didn't clean up. That's what the problem is. No, we have the power to eliminate those roaches, but we have to be paid what it costs to spend the minutes and the product in there to get that done. And somehow we've got to let our customers know that is the case. Yeah. It's tough because at the end of the day, management, it's all about liability. You told me you, you read the contract and a contract says you're going to get rid of these pests and this is your price. So it's just CYA. Most of these contracts that I have read don't say anything about getting rid of the pests. Okay. Nothing. They say we're going to go in there and treat once every three months. And I don't know what that means. Does that mean bring the cockroaches ice cream? I don't know. Treats? Yeah, the ones that we've looked at here, city contracts, we stopped looking at them. But they all were very specific. Even the schools in New York City one, you had to be Green Shield certified, which we are. And two, if the kitchen received a violation related to pest, the pest control company had to pay it. Wow. And the winning bidder of that bid was $45 an hour. Jeez. Yes, gee, yes. And Green Shield is even more, there's a lot of restrictions, even with gel baits. Not that you couldn't get the job done, but it would be more labor intensive. So at forty five dollars mm -hmm. an hour. You're not gonna get gel baits. No. Well, they're not getting the job done, really. They're applying yeah. pesticide but not doing pest control. Yeah. That's the thing that's killing me these days. I'm asking when I give my presentations, are we in the pest control business or the pesticide application business? And we really need to investigate that, decide what we are. It's almost like we went backwards from the late 80s, early 90s, to be honest. I even hear really intelligent business owners 
saying things like, and, and we, they don't believe in resistance. They only believe in aversion. You know, it's all about seek and destroy. I believe it is about finding where they are and treating. I think the assessment is good. I think paying attention and rotating chemicals. I just heard somebody really sharp on a podcast talk about, we never rotated chemicals. So again, I think it's really about the industry being more educated as well as the consumer and just yeah. being smarter and buying into science. <laughs> We've got a strange job in the sense that we work with a biological system where resistance and genetics, genetics, that's all resistance is about, play a big role in what we do. And then we have the social side. What are the humans doing? And a lot of it is about infrastructure. We paid $5.44 last year and we have to get our contracts ready to go and submitted a year in advance. So we can't put any increases in. That's one of the things that's happened with US HUD is that they have to have their expenditures submitted to the HUD authorities a year in advance. So they never look at increasing the budget for pest control. And this is one of the reasons that 10 years can go by and they can pay less, but they can't pay more. Yeah. yeah, particularly in the state of Virginia, the demographic that lives in public housing is like 96% African-American, 91% single mothers. And talk about one demographic having to deal with more German cockroaches than any other. If these were restaurants, they would be shut down. And yet the people are constantly forced to live in these conditions that we have the capability to cure. And yet we blame them, oh, they don't clean up because that's the easy way out. But in real life, the technician does not have enough time to do pest control. And, and that's, that's the whole, that's the whole deal right it there. Is. And we can't stress that enough. And time is not just time spent on the site. There's a multitude of things. If you have yeah. customer service specialists, everything. You said you've been able to get eradication Complete. over several months. Yeah. And the roaches without the residents doing any cleaning at all. We had no cockroaches show up till after the end of the study. So seven months, they went with no roaches at all, with wow. no special cleaning, nothing. And a lot of people say, oh, well, the roaches will come right back out if they don't clean. That wasn't the case. And we weren't doing whole buildings either. We were doing isolated populations in these apartment buildings. So it's like the roaches didn't decide to come over from next door either. I guess they had it too good over there. <laughs> the other thing I recommend is opening those three traps, not counting individual roaches, because I don't think anybody'd have time, but you can look at it and go, that's high, medium and low, but also take a photograph of that with your phone and send it to the management, whether they want it or not, so that they have some vision of what these places look like, because a lot of them prefer not to know. But we're gonna give them, that's why it's assessment-based pest management, we are gonna give them the records of the pest control so that we can show them that we have fewer roaches after our treatments than we did before. Because right now they ask for no documentation whatsoever that there's, the pest problem has been reduced. None. Yep. We, we have a commercial kitchen and if there's conducive conditions, we take pictures, the guys mark them up. And every time they get a pest issue, the, the manager will say, maybe if you sent less pictures and did more work, they, they don't want the pictures anymore, which is hilarious. <laughs> that is one of the issues too, because I had a manager ask me, what are you doing with these photographs? Worried that I was going to go on News Channel 10 and be able to show them. And, and that is a temptation, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so, I was consulting with this company. They had a contract with the New York City Housing Authority. It was asthma abatement. And they put blurbs in different papers. You could sign up and you get this free service. And we were having really good results with caulking and gelling and whatever. And we were going back once a week for a month. And we had put a lot of uh, traps around. And I said, okay, we'll go back once a month. And they said, no, that's it. You don't have to go back to that place anymore. <laughs> I found out the people 
had got their blurb in the different newspapers, how wonderful they, they did with this thing. And so it wasn't necessary anymore. They got what they wanted. Mm. So, oh, you know, you, you deal with all kinds of shenanigans and stuff. We You're sold right. you on. <laughs> so, Dini, what do you think we should expect in the coming months with everybody getting vaccinated and the world, and hopefully at least the U.S., reopening? I think that the pest control industry will suddenly find that they've got more pests to deal with than they might have anticipated. I think there will be a little bit of an upsurge, and especially because we're going into the summer months, so German cockroaches start loving each other up pretty big. And let's say that we get everything with everybody vaccinated and things as early as June or July, which I I hope, but I don't know if that'll be the case, then we can expect that the pest populations are going to be doing just great. And I think we'll have a lot of work to do, especially with places wanting to reopen and have people come in. They can't be at risk of having cockroaches running around on the floor at that time. So we may see a lot of work out there. That's what I anticipate, certainly. And I know for public housing, that's going to be explosive. So we'll see what apartments look like. And again, getting more access to these bed bug infested locations. Because again, a lot of the elderly have been reluctant. They don't want people coming in because of the fear for their health issues. And so they're probably sitting there on a lot of bed bugs without having called a pest control company to do anything about it. So should be pretty spectacular. That's what I think. So you know that New York and certainly New York City is uh, super progressive is probably the right word. Have you heard of the local law 55? It's the Asthma Free Housing Act. Mm, and it, mm-hmm. it, but it, part of it is mandating inspections in all multifamily housing at a minimum of once a year for things like roaches, rodents, mold. But really for us, roaches and rodents is huge and making recommendations. And it all has to be tracked by the property owner and submitted through this local law 55 form. We have another local law 69 that speaks specifically to bed bugs and reporting and tracking. But this one is more for roaches and rodents because they have that asthma trigger. But um, Now, do you have to inspect every apartment unit? I forget the exact wording, but you have to make an effort. You have to alert every apartment that you, you, these are the weeks you're trying to inspect and somebody needs to be home. And I believe in certain apartment complexes, depending on how it's written, it can be mandated. And in others, you can opt out of it. But we've had to come up with new plans to get those inspections done for some mm-hmm. of our resident apartment complexes. So it speaks to what you you are looking for, at least mandating yeah. that inspection once a year. Right? Yes. <laughs> I was talking to somebody else, and I don't remember what state they were in, but also looking at asthma-related inspections. I want to say North Carolina, but I'm not sure. So that would make sense. But then, again, that's where that assessment-based pest management is really going to come in a big way. Yeah. Because you may or may not have heard of REAC inspections for public housing, where they alert public housing authorities, though, what units they're going to inspect. So that kind of gives the public housing authority a little bit of time to go fix whatever it is. But they have to prove that all federal housing is safe and habitable and things like that. So you get marked off points for having tripping hazards or broken doors or broken windows, things like that. You also lost a couple of points for having a cockroach infestation, okay? And the infestation was considered two dead roaches or one live roach. And from a biological point of view, two dead roaches cannot be an infestation, okay? They're dead. One live means that they don't have a boyfriend or girlfriend, so that can't be an infestation either. And we're trying to get that situation changed to where they actually put out traps overnight because the apartment management has gotten so used to being marked down for having German cockroaches, they really don't worry about it. But they lose only a very low number of points for it. Why? One of the main reasons is because it's the resident's fault, right? And unlike tripping hazards and things like that, where they could be sued, 
the excuse that it's the resident's fault gets them off the hook and they don't worry about that too much. But they don't lose extra points for having 16,000 roaches in the same apartment. And that's quite common. I would love to see a change. Bobby Corrigan was a champion of it changing when he was involved with the city. I don't know how far he got along with it. Let's not get into politics. No, I understand, but I think I'm going to have to get into politics just because I don't know how we're going to get rid of these cockroach populations that have been allowed to just continue for 30 years and easily excused. Not my fault, but being able to document that we had the power to get rid of them without doing anything extraordinary, just using bait, not asking the resident to clean up or anything like that, it's inexcusable now. So I'm hoping we'll be able to move that forward. But yes, we'd have to hit all of these apartments every month for a period of time, not once every three months for two minutes. That's not going to do it. So the cost will go up. Yes. But over time, it may level out. Yes, it will. It may be a stick of shock. And then if you follow the program correctly, then truly maintain it. And not be overcome with roaches. Right. Yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? And that's the thing. Even if we got rid of every cockroach in public housing, okay, we would still need somebody there on a quarterly basis to put traps out, check them, and just keep everything in line. And that has a cost associated with it, too. Yeah. But that's the thing, is you're ensuring that you're not overrunning the place with German cockroaches. We've just got to think differently. Assessment based with the sticky traps is great. What are your thoughts on the the current technology, the ERM stuff, electronic rodent monitoring? Some people are also coming out. I saw a trap eight years ago that was both for rodents and insects. Do you think that's potentially the future of the assessment base? I think it is. So in Japan right now, they also have fly traps in restaurants that are electronic that will send pictures to your phone on what is captured in the fly trap. So that lets you know, lets the technician know that they better get out there if a restaurant's having a particular problem. I've also worked with Delta 5, who has the electronic bed bug monitor. Now, Here's where we are with some of that technology. The Delta 5s, you plug them into the wall and they are hooked up to the Wi-Fi for the hotel. And so a bug crawls into the trap and then that sends a picture of that bug to your phone. So instead of having like pitfall traps for bed bugs, where you would have to go in and check every pitfall trap every month, every two months, every three months, I went and calculated the cost of checking pitfall traps for 4,000 units, like using US HUD as an example. And you'd have to hire somebody full time to do nothing but that if they just checked them once a month. But the time it takes to get in the door, the time it takes to find the monitors, clean them out if you need to. So this electronic trap seems like a great idea, especially for hotels. You get the message on your phone. You don't have to go and check every trap in there, but you go and check this one and find out what the deal is and then decide what to do. The only thing is, is it does work on Wi-Fi. The thing about hotels, they have a central Wi-Fi system. And everybody's on the same one. Imagine apartments where everybody pays for their own Wi-Fi. How do you manage that situation? Or like low-income housing where they have 700 eightplex and fourplex and duplex buildings. So every one of them would have to have their own hotspot. That's where it gets challenging is the locations that we put them in. But regardless, in answer to your question, yeah, I think this electronic monitoring is definitely going to be a thing of the future. Because we've had class action lawsuits, especially with bed bugs, in apartment facilities where there have been known bed bug infestations, let's say over time, 10% of the building has had infestations or 30% of the building has had infestations. If you're the owner these days and you can't document that you have done something proactively after having all these infestations, it's very easy to have a class action lawsuit saying you're not doing anything to prevent bed bugs from taking over the place. And I think these electronic monitors are going to be the economic solution to those situations in the future, rather than having to pay somebody who just checks monitors all day long. 
to demonstrate you are doing something proactively? The very first one that we looked at eight years ago was so intricate. You would mm -hmm. have to build out your own Wi-Fi and put repeaters every two or three stories in the building. So the client was like, no, we're not interested at all. Even with the stuff donated, they mm -hmm. weren't interested in doing it. It was too invasive. But uh, I still think it's the future. Yeah, um, We're actually going to be testing one of the systems out in our own office. Because a big thing with that, too, is truly understanding the data. Mm -hmm. Working with this Delta 5 monitor, there were challenges because sometimes the residents, they unplug it. Why'd you unplug it? Oh, well, because it was plugged in, that kind of thing. <laughs> so there were some challenges like that. But when I was comparing the cost of checking pitfall monitors in labor, even though the um, pitfalls were $5 a piece and the Delta 5s were $50, the amount of labor cost really made a huge difference in the fact that the pitfalls ended up costing a lot more than the electronics. And I think that'll be the way that we go, like you were saying, in the future, definitely. You always got to ex explain the finance piece to them. You have to sell them on the long-term effects and that they'll right. save money in the long term. One last question. One of the reasons for the podcast was help changing the perception of PMPs, even just to change people from using the word exterminator to yes. pest management professional has been challenging. Sharing education, structure challenges, and, and things behind what we do, what you are passionate about changing the industry. Do you have any suggestions for all of us in the industry, how we can attract more smart, resourceful individuals? That's the thing is I think that we're going to have to promote more of our educational background because I think it's hard to get a lot of people interested in the pest management industry who don't know anything about it because they do have that same vision that somebody's grandmother has that we're spray jockeys. But I think being able to promote the fact that we have these conferences that are intended to increase education, keep up with the technology, we've got to also make people feel, these technicians, they've got to feel that their job is doing some good. And again, I don't think think the technicians who are usually the newest, lowest paid going in and just applying pesticide and not doing pest control, I don't think that job is very rewarding for them. So we need to be able to show people who might be interested in joining our industry the value of it and what we are doing for society and humanity and people out there that really need our help. And that's another reason that I was thinking this promotion of the MPMA commercial where they're walking around the very expensive house and everything makes us look like a luxury item, maybe. But if we were able to actually show potential technicians that we can go in there and save the day for some people that are living in dire situations, I think that would mean a lot. And that we have the education, the knowledge, we know pests, we're part entomologists, we are pesticide specialists. They can feel like, okay, this would be a rewarding job to have. I've said this more than once. One of the best job posts that we put out there, the title was, do you want to be a superhero? Yes, exactly. And, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Do you want to help people? Do you want yeah. to be an environmental steward? Some people might call it fluff, but it's, it's all true. It is true. It doesn't get promoted a lot, but it doesn't get promoted that way is that we're out there to save some people from some dire situations. And again, that's why I'm thinking commercials of some of these heavy infestations might wake some people up as to what our expertise really is. Yeah. You know, it does amaze me that 40 years later, we're still having the same conversations about pricing yeah. and professionalism <laughs> and but I'm still optimistic. Yeah. And again, that's why I'm a big promoter of the minimal prep for bed bugs, just like Bed Bug Central, and also the no prep for doing the cockroach work, that we are in there to save the day and we're not dependent on, oh, the resident didn't do it, so you can't expect much. No, we can save the day no matter what. There you go. 
have you tra- you haven't traveled for business have you You've been grounded no. for over a year and i've gotten the largest grant i'd ever had for us hud and we were working in baltimore and richmond and hopewell housing and going into about 80 units at each facility and then we docked it down to 40 when we found our test units and everything and that all just came to a halt so i'm really hopeful that we'll be able to start again by this october and again we're going in there using assessment based stress management taking the times that it takes to get in the door to pick up the traps take the pictures of the traps, decide on how much bait to use, and then the quantity of bait, how much we put out, and how long it takes, so that we will have accurate numbers showing how much it really costs to do this. As we get rid of the roaches, now all of them, we're going in, putting traps out, picking them up, and that's it. And that's what we did in the last study that was published in 2019. Because these traps were only out for one night, unless they got wet or something, we could reuse them again the next month. So that saved us 81 cents per trap. So we've been looking at the financial end on how to do this the most efficiently. So question, when you eliminate an infestation, do you leave any gel bait behind or you just stick to the assessment? If we have no cockroaches in the traps, we don't do anything. We pick the traps up and we leave and we come back later. And for those units over the course of uh, three months that have no trap catch at all, and we talk to the resident because they're there. We ask them, have you seen anything? And if they say no, they haven't seen anything, then we put them on a quarterly monitoring basis. And that's what we do from then on. Our last calculation to just monitor and nothing else is about $7. But that's what it takes to get in there and put out three 81 cent traps and pick them up and all that sort of stuff. But I think that's totally worth it compared to the thousands upon thousands of roaches that these people have been living with and that the management is giving homes to. The proof is in the pudding. Your research shows how it can work. And, And hopefully once it shows that they'll adopt it. And that'll be the standard. The problem uh, is outrageous. And that's why I'm going to try and work directly with U.S. HUD, because like your allergy situation in um, New York, that they are just allowing this to continue, these populations to continue forever and ever. And one of the things that has allowed that to continue is no documentation of it whatsoever. And that's why taking pictures of these traps and sending it to the management, whether they want them or not, is a big deal. Becomes undeniable what the situation (laughs) is. And again, my argument is our customers, many of them have not paid what pest control takes. And we've had a lot of salespeople that have undersold things to get accounts. And then that's gotten it in people's heads that pest control just doesn't cost very much. Yeah. And again, no reason we shouldn't be up there with plumbers and electricians. But we need people to understand that they need to pay for our time. And they don't get that at all. They think every time I talk to people, they think they're paying for the pesticide, which is you can do a unit with some of our products for three cents a door. We struggle with hiring a salesperson for that exact reason. Mm -hmm. But what I've come to realize is the onus is still on the owner of the business. You could set mandates, but they should never be able to sell below a certain point. And there should be checks on that. And if you're doing your marketing correctly from an owner perspective, then you should only be getting the leads you want where you can sell at your price. So yes, yeah, salespeople have to make their quotas, but it's almost done intentionally within larger companies to just get that sale when what really should happen is get the quality sales and and go from there. It's something that we all struggle with as owners on how to do that, especially on a commission-based position, right? You need to have production. But I do think that a lot of the onus is on ownership. They could mandate what their salespeople do. They could see what's going wrong and they could tweak things internally to give the salesperson the best opportunity to make the most money. And get the job done because that's right. the biggest thing. Technical versus sales. I feel you on that one. 
Ray Johnson, who was the president of the MPMA, I don't remember what year, but a few years back, he had told me one time that if he had a salesperson that undersold an account, that salesperson had to do the work. That's, That's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, you're a genius, man. That's exactly it. So no pushing it off on somebody else. Yay, I got my sale. And then somebody else has to live with that situation. I'm like, that's a brilliant guy who does that. <laughs> but yeah, you have to be watching all the time. We covered a lot today for everybody listening. Deanie Miller, Dr. Deanie Miller, <laughs> Virginia Tech. Listen, uh, that's no small feat, Deanie. We got to make sure yeah. we say it correctly. If you'd have told me when I was 20 years old, that my life was going to be about bed bugs and cockroaches, I would have told you you were crazy. But yeah. I have to say, it's turned out to be the best life ever. I love it. That's awesome. Truly. Mr. and Mrs. American, all the ships at sea. This has been a very educational episode here with Dr. Deanie Miller. Hopefully we'll see you in Vegas for uh, Pest World. Oh, that would be awesome. I would love it. Yay. Let's hope open everything up. opens up. Thank you again, Deanie, and we'll speak to you soon.